Greetings, this is Greg. I want to talk about the Aleutian IL-2 Sturmovic and specifically about its armament. Armament is obviously a really important factor with ground attack aircraft. They need weapons and munitions that will allow them to deal with a wide range of targets, from soft targets all the way up to heavily armored vehicles like tanks. And ideally, these weapons need to be able to take out the targets quickly so the plane doesn't need to make repeated passes, increasing its risk of being shot down. In many cases, including cases with the IL-2, ground attack aircraft need to attack naval targets as well, which can vary tremendously in armor and defensive fire. By Western standards, the Sturmovic was not particularly well armed. In fact, by the numbers, if you're just looking at aircraft stats, the Sturmovic falls short in a lot of areas. However, it's very important to keep context in mind here. They built a lot of Sturmoviks, and sometimes quantity brings its own special type of quality to the equation. In fact, Joseph Stalin himself made that point exactly. Thus, a lot of Soviet hardware was built with that philosophy in mind. The plane was originally to be armed with five 7.62 millimeter machine guns which are nominally 30 caliber. Keep in mind, in the early stages of development, the plane wasn't called the IL-2. They had various designations for the prototypes. I'm just calling them all IL-2s to keep it simple. Anyway, 30 caliber machine guns were pretty standard on warplanes at the time, so they made some sense here. There were to be four of them, two mounted in each wing firing forward, and one in the rear position providing defensive fire. Between the time the plane was originally designed in 1938 and its introduction into service in 1941, a lot had happened over in Europe. Germany invaded Poland, then Britain and France declared war on Germany, more Blitzkrieg, then the fall of France and the Battle of Britain, and all of these things involved air power. During this period, it was realized that 7.62 millimeter machine guns just wouldn't have enough punch for a ground attack aircraft. While they were great for taking out people, horses, non-armored vehicles, things like tanks were another matter. Essentially, every armored vehicle on the battlefield was now armored against 30 caliber fire, and there was a good reason for this. Broadly speaking, infantry units for most countries were equipped with 30 caliber rifles. So if you're going to bother to armor a vehicle at all, it makes sense to protect it from at least 30 cal as a minimum. Therefore, if building a ground attack aircraft, it makes sense to equip it with something heavier than 30 cals. Now, this concept wasn't lost on Sergei Aleutian, so the decision was made to remove two of the machine guns and substitute them with a pair of Taubin MP6 23mm automatic cannons. The designer of the MP6 cannon was Yakov Taubin. Now, at this point, our story gets a little murky and even takes a pretty dark turn. Taubin's cannon worked, and based on the fact that he was awarded the Order of Lenin for the cannon, I have to think it worked well, or at least okay. However, it appears to me, and this is entirely my opinion, but it certainly looks to me like Sergei Aleutian either didn't like Taubin personally, or didn't want to use his cannon for some other reason, probably a political one. I know that's a big statement, and I can't prove it, but I think the evidence adds up, so follow along here. The official reason given by Aleutian for shunning the Taubin 23mm cannon was that its recoil was too strong. Now, as I've said many times on this channel before, firearms are outside my area of expertise, but to me, this explanation just doesn't seem to pass the reasonableness test. Yes, recoil can vary a lot from one weapon to another, even when they are of the same caliber. But by aircraft standards, a 23mm cannon just wasn't that extreme for mounting on a ground attack airplane. I just find it hard to believe that the IL-2's wing structure, which was pretty stout, couldn't be easily modified to handle this. In fact, as you will see later, they did modify it to handle 37 millimeter cannons. I'm not the only one who feels this way. In this book, which is a very friendly book to Sergei Aleutian, in reference to recoil being the reason for Aleutian shunning this weapon, the author says, quote, In actual fact, it is far more likely that he was guided by other considerations, namely his mistrust of the ability of the Taubin Design Bureau 
to produce a reliable and trouble-free weapon, unquote. Now, I agree with the author that it's far more likely that Aleutian was guided by other considerations, meaning not the recoil issue. However, I find the author's theory that this was about Aleutian's mistrust of the Taubin Design Bureau's quality control to be unlikely because, well, it's in the name. Taubin ran a design bureau. Actual production of the weapon would have been handled in a state-run factory because Soviet Union and communism. Although I certainly can see that the word produce could have a couple meanings here, especially as this is the result of a translation from Russian. Now, there absolutely were some problems mounting this gun onto aircraft and specifically onto the IL-2. The recoil was pretty strong and it was mounted in the part of the IL-2's wings that had a lot of wood. Not that you can't mount a powerful gun into a wood structure, you can, but it's involved more so when it's a wooden wing. Moving them inboard to the metal center sections wasn't a practical option because that would have required putting them inboard of the landing gear, which would have then put them inside of the propeller arc, thus requiring synchronization gear, complicating the whole thing and decreasing the weapon's rate of fire. The primary problems with Taubin's gun were related to the way the gun was fed ammunition. Several changes were made, but they gave up and swapped in 20mm Chevex, which were commonly used on Soviet aircraft. I hope I'm saying that name right. Actually, I'm not too concerned about it either way, but you can see the spelling on screen. Normally, at least by Western standards, when you take a gun that works outside of an aircraft and then put it into an aircraft, it's primarily incumbent upon the aircraft manufacturer to make it work. The aircraft manufacturer is going to work out the mounts, the gun heating, ammunition, stowage, and so on. For example, the Browning M250 Cal was used in nearly every U.S. combat plane in World War II. They were not building a different version of this gun for every airplane it was used in. The various aircraft manufacturers made them work. Usually it went well, sometimes it didn't. The early P-51s, the A's and B's, had jamming issues because of the way North Americans set up the ammo feeds, which they fixed in later models, D models and later. Now, nobody blames Browning for those earlier problems in that airplane. The same is true of the Hispano Suiza derived 20 mils that were in widespread use by the British and to a lesser extent by the US. However, in the case of the IL-2, all of the blame here regarding installation into the plane seemed to be placed on Yakov Taubin. He was arrested and executed in 1941. He was charged with two things. First, preserving samples of unfinished weapons, which seems like a ridiculous thing to charge a weapons designer with. Of course he's going to have bits and pieces of unfinished weapons lying around. The guy was a weapons designer and the head of a weapon design bureau. The other charge against him, the one that at least makes a little bit of sense, was that he was plotting to produce technically unfinished and unsatisfactory weapons. And this was all about the MP6 23mm and its failure in the IL-2. Now, after they shot Taubin, they put his body into a mass grave containing many of the victims of Soviet executions. That mass grave is now the site of Yuri Gagarin Park in Samara, Russia. Not that it does Taubin any good, but he was exonerated of wrongdoing in 1955. So it seems at least some others agree with me that this whole thing was unjust. It seems to me that this entire affair has less to do with technical issues with the MP6 and more to do with the fact that Taubin had run afoul of the establishment. He had been butting heads with Grigory Kulik over previous Taubin designs, uh, specifically the AG2 grenade launcher. Kulik was a personal friend of Stalin's. They fought together in the Russian Civil War. As a side note, Kulik is seriously in the running for most inept and possibly most evil general-slash-administrator of the war. He was against production of the T-34 medium tank. He was against the KV-1 heavy tank, against the Katyusha rocket system, and he was even against giving troops submachine guns. The Soviets had a pretty good submachine gun. All of these things were key weapons in the eventual Soviet successes, and Kulik was against every single one of them. He also oversaw executions in Poland following the Soviet invasion of that country. This included the executions of over 21,000 Polish officers in the Katyn massacre. The Soviets were executing so many people in Poland 
that they had to switch to a lower powered handgun for the job because the executioner's wrists were getting tired from the recoil. And that's literally a true story. Although he seemed to be a perpetual screw up and a terrible person, his friendship with Stalin saved him from execution during the war, although he was demoted at least once. It's hard to know what was in someone's head, but I have the impression that Kulik didn't like Taubin, and I think it's likely Aleutian was smart enough to sort of toe the line there and stay out of trouble. However, Kulik's relationship with Stalin did not hold up, as he, along with other Soviet generals, were executed after the war once they were no longer needed. This was done to ensure that their popularity could not be leveraged against the political establishment. I guess the point of my discussing all that is to make it clear that Stalin's regime was really into executing people. Nobody was really safe, and Taubin was on the wrong guy's radar. Even if his 23mm cannon was perfect, and it wasn't, but even if it was, I think he was doomed. Let's get back to the IL-2. The first production IL-2s had a pair of 7.6mm, 7.62mm machine guns, and a pair of 20mm cannons. The 20mm were Shevix. This is a decent gun. We have an excellent evaluation of it, courtesy of the U.S. Navy's Bureau of Ordnance. I'll put this document up in the Patreon section. The Shevik 20 mil specs, like rate of fire range and so forth, all look pretty good. It's very comparable in these terms to other World War II era 20 mils. However, it's not made to last. And while it was cheap to build in terms of materials, building this gun was pretty labor intensive because final fitting of the parts was done by filing them down. They used relatively soft metals in the gun's construction. These non-hardened, non-heat treated metals had the advantage of not breaking easily. They're also easier to file than hardened metals, but the downside was very rapid wear. The guns were built with what by normal standards would be considered very loose tolerances. It was not a precision piece of work. It couldn't be because when you file stuff by hand, there's going to be some variation from part to part. So you have to have large tolerances so that everything can at least still fit together. Plus, in the field, someone might need to remove parts from one gun and put them on another. The only way to be able to do that when stuff is filed by hand is to have somewhat loose tolerances. All this will reduce the life of the gun and reduce accuracy. However, in practical terms, I don't think this mattered in this particular application. The life expectancy of an IL-2 or any World War II era aircraft just wasn't that long, especially on the Eastern Front. As for accuracy, well, it's not that big of a deal here either. When mounted on an airplane, all sorts of things combine to adversely affect accuracy. The gun's displacement from the pilot's gun sight, the flexing of the wing, the vibration of the plane, even the adjustments done by the armorer on each individual aircraft and individual gun could vary a bit. I don't have data on this, but I suspect all of these factors together are much larger than those introduced by the sloppy production of the weapon itself. The pilot of an IL-2 isn't trying to hit the center of a bullseye at a thousand yards. He's strafing trucks, groups of enemy soldiers, armored vehicles, and so on. He just needs to hit the target. That's why the IL-2 has four automatic weapons with high rates of fire, not four sniper rifles. In addition to the two 20 mils, the early production IL-2s had a pair of 7.62mm Shekus machine guns. These were on nearly every production IL-2 that saw combat in the war. In terms of production, these were much like the cannon we talked about. It's not a precision piece of work, but it's made well enough to do the job. That's a theme with Soviet equipment in general. The big factor working in favor of this gun was its high rate of fire, an incredible 2,000 rounds per minute. Compare that with a British 303 of the time in a Spitfire, which was putting out about 1,150 rounds per minute. Now, just to be clear, that 2,000 rounds per minute for the IL-2's IL machine guns are when the gun is wing-mounted outside of the prop arc, as it is in the IL-2. When this same gun is synchronized to fire through the prop arc in other types of airplanes, it slows down. These machine guns won't destroy tanks, neither will the 20 mils, at least not in any practical terms but they will make a mess of anything that isn't armored. And although there were only two of them, that rate of fire really helps to make up for it. 
Ammo supply was 750 rounds per gun for the machine guns, but only 40 rounds per gun for the cannons. So the machine guns did a lot of the work on this airplane. Not only were they effective against soft targets, they could also be used to help aim the cannons and conserve their very limited ammo. Now, sometime in 1942, they seriously upgraded the IL-2's firepower by swapping out those 20 mils and putting in 23 millimeter VYA cannons with 150 rounds per gun, so over three times the amount of cannon ammo of the previous versions. This was really the IL-2 gun configuration, dual 7.62s and dual 23s. Yeah, there were other configurations, but this was the most common and probably the best setup the plane had. The VYA 23s were built with largely the same concepts we talked about before, but even more so. The components, which were largely filed and honed to fit by hand, were very sloppily made. In fact, the whole gun was so sloppily made and so imprecise that components could not be changed from one gun to another. It was another throwaway weapon. The design of the YVA, correction, VYA 23 millimeter was heavily influenced by a Finnish weapon. The Soviets copied the basic design, made it into a 12.7 millimeter machine gun. These were throwaway weapons by design, the Soviet version, not the Finnish version. They were intended to be discarded after a short period of use due to wear. Eventually, this design was sort of scaled up and up and ultimately became a 23 millimeter cannon, which is what we're talking about here. It's a very hard hitting weapon. The muzzle velocity from this thing is equal to or slightly greater than a US 50 cal or a 20 millimeter Hispano. Its rate of fire was 650 to 750 rounds per minute, about like a typical World War II 20 millimeter. Due to its sloppy construction, it's not particularly accurate, but there are upsides. Not only could they be produced rapidly, their loose tolerances made them less likely to jam or have problems in cold temperatures, which was an advantage enjoyed by many Soviet guns. It was a great weapon for a ground attack airplane. It had a big punch, good rate of fire, and was easy to keep working. I should add that in the event of a jam, the guns in the IL-2 could be cleared by the pilot in flight via pneumatic charging, or at least the version discussed in the pilot's manual that I have translated says that. There could be some examples or versions of this plane where that wasn't true, but I don't think so. There were a lot of armament variations for the IL-2. A lot of them are not worth spending time on, but one of them that it is, and that is the use of the 37 millimeter cannons in underwing pods. There were two different types of 37 mils used. For identification purposes, they're easy to tell apart because they're in two very different looking gun pods. This IL-2 has the large pods, which indicate it's one of the few examples fitted with the SH-37 millimeter cannons. The huge pods are needed because they store not only the big cannons, but the ammo. Plus, they have some sort of recoil or shock-absorbing mount built in to deal with that recoil. I don't have much data on the SH-37 because very few of these guns were built. It wasn't a successful gun and wasn't successful on the IL-2. Only a handful were built this way, uh, just in the dozens. However, the idea of equipping the plane with 37mm cannons didn't die out with the SH-37. Someone thought this was a sound idea, at least in principle. And they tried again with the apparently much better NS 37 millimeter cannon. NS stands for Noodleman Saranov. Guess who Alexander Noodleman had been working for? Well, he had been working under Yakov Taubin at his design bureau. After Taubin was executed, they put Noodleman in charge of this particular design bureau, which was called OKB 16. Apparently, Taubin taught Noodleman pretty well because, by all accounts, the NS 37 was a darn good gun, and after the war it was replaced by the N-37, which became a standard Soviet aircraft-mounted weapon for much of the Cold War. The problem in the case of the IL-2 was that the big 37 millimeter weapons just didn't work out all that well in practical terms when they were on the aircraft. Now, in theory, the NS-37 can knock out a medium tank or even a Tiger tank with a very well-placed or lucky shot. It probably happened. I'm sure they knocked out some Panzer IVs with these things anyway. However, the reality was that it was very difficult to do. The cannons and their pods caused a huge loss of aircraft performance, and then when they were fired, 
they caused the plane to pitch down aggressively and yaw side to side because the two cannons were not effectively synchronized to fire together at the same time. The solution to this was recommend firing in bursts of only three rounds per gun with the NS-37 equipped IL-2s. Any more than that, and it was impossible to keep the guns on target. That limited their usage to about a half second burst, and then the plane had to be lined up on the target again. And there just wasn't much time to do this with the speed, dive angles, and altitudes usually involved in this sort of work. Now, again, if they hit the tank, maybe it would destroy it, but they had to be pretty lucky. Even if they did hit the tank and stop it, it was more likely stopped due to some minor damage and not really destroyed track damage or something like that. Now, that's not trivial. If the tank crew has to stop and fix the track, it can be a huge problem. It might not make it to the impending battle. However, the 23 millimeters could also cause this type of damage and were far easier to hit with and carried much greater ammo supply. There was another problem with the twin 37 mils. They reduced the IL-2's already not stellar bomb load by about 75%. That was a big problem. Bombs are effective weapons in ground attack, and you want them on your ground attack airplane. There is no question that the IL-2 pilots much preferred the standard armament with the 7.62 and 23 millimeter cannon combo combined with the heavier bomb load. In fact, in this book, it states that the pilots were unanimous. That's literally the word used, unanimous, in this opinion. Thus, the 37 millimeter armed IL-2s were only in service for about a year and in relatively low numbers, which is why there are not many pictures of them. Another factor working against not only the 37 mil equipped IL-2s, but all the big cannon planes of World War II was the advent of effective rockets. Rockets offered far more firepower than the large caliber cannons, and once fired, the plane no longer had to carry the weight penalty of the cannon installation, which was usually quite a lot. Let's move on to bombs. The bomb load of the IL-2 is not that impressive. Most had a maximum bomb load of 1,320 pounds, some lesser variants only 880 pounds. Interestingly, some variants had internal bomb bays located in the wings. I couldn't find a single photo showing these bomb bays, but we do have this drawing from the manual. There were four of these bays, two per side between the landing gear and the fuselage. The plane could carry a variety of bombs. Commonly, it would carry six 220-pound or 100-kilogram bombs for a total of 1,320 pounds. The plane's bomb site was poor and of little use. However, the plane did have the ability to use cluster munitions, which were specifically designed in this case to knock out tanks, and these solved all sorts of problems for the IL-2 pilots. These were the PTAB or PTAB bombs, which were a high explosive anti-tank or heat weapon. They used a shape charge and not velocity to do their work. Thus, they could be dropped from low altitude. They were normally dropped from a height of only 100 meters. Typically, the plane would carry 192 of these 5.5 pound bombs and lay down a carpet 70 meters long and 15 meters wide. I'll save you the trouble of doing the math. That works out to one little bomb per five and a half square meters. The Panzer IV has over 16 square meters of surface area up top. Thus, the pilot of an IL-2 doesn't have to be all that accurate to hit a tank with these munitions. These weapons solve all sorts of problems. Poor bombsight, not a problem. Inexperienced pilot who can't aim that well, again, not a problem. When you hear stories of IL-2s destroying or at least knocking out tanks, these are usually the weapons they were using. I don't normally talk about current events or warfare. It's not that I can't, it's just that I don't care to on this channel. But it's being reported that the Ukrainians are now attaching these same weapons or possibly Cold War versions of the same thing to drones and disabling modern Soviet tanks with them because the drones have the ability to accurately target specific vulnerable areas on the tank, making these weapons even more effective. The IL-2 could also carry smaller 3.3 pound versions of this and take more of them, but the 5.5 pound version seems to have been more common, although I can't really quantify that. It's just that the bigger one is more often mentioned in secondary sources. 
Speaking of sources, in this video, I'm relying on two primary sources and two secondary. The primary sources are the Soviet IL-2 pilot's manual and the U.S. Navy's book on weapons. The secondary sources are this book, which focuses entirely on Aleutian aircraft, and this is the one I've relied on more heavily. I also used this book, which is part of a two-volume set, and it's also quite good. Of course, the two primary sources can be found in the Patreon section. Obviously, I can't put the secondary sources there. I don't even like putting pages from them on screen due to possible copyright or ethical issues. I certainly don't have any blessing from the authors to do that. If this is the type of content you enjoy, please like and subscribe and consider joining my Patreon. You get access to nearly all of the research material I use, pilot manuals, historical documents, and more. Plus, I have polls there to help determine the direction of the channel, which is why I'm making this IL-2 series. It was voted for on Patreon. Enough of the self-promotion. Let's get back to the video. Moving on, rockets. The IL-2 could carry either the RS-82 or RS-132 rockets. The number there indicates their diameter in millimeters. They are 3.2 and 5.2 inch rockets, respectively. Typically, single-seat IL-2s could carry eight rockets. Two-seaters were limited to only four. The larger RS-132 carried a two-pound warhead, and if it hit a tank, would very likely knock it out and possibly destroy it. The problem was in hitting the target. These rockets were horribly inaccurate, especially the larger 132. However, when used in mass, especially when attacking a large group of enemy vehicles, Maybe they could hit things, but the overall problem was that for taking out armor, the PTABs were a better choice. For attacking troops or any vehicles that were, let's say, equal to a half-track or less in terms of armor, the machine gun cannon combo would do the job. The German half-tracks were generally only armored against 8mm fire, but they were also open at the top, which made them more vulnerable to air attack. In terms of firepower, it's difficult to find an Allied airplane that is comparable to the IL-2. There really isn't a U.S. or British equivalent of this airplane. I think the best comparison is Germany's FW-190 F-8. An argument could be made for the Stuka, but the Stuka is first and foremost a dive bomber, and the IL-2 isn't. The Germans also had the Henschel, but that's a twin-engine airplane. The 190 F-8 was well-armored, and about equal to the IL-2 in firepower and in terms of bomb load. So it's probably the plane I'll use for comparison in future episodes. Let me know what you think uh, in regards to that question. That's all for now. Goodbye and have a great day.